It's time to start your Wednesday off with some Countdown to Classic. This is a podcast that educates, informs, and gossips about World of Warcraft Classic. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we discuss the news, hot-button issues, and content of the highly anticipated World of Warcraft Classic. I'm your host, Josh Corbett, and as you all know by now, this is a show where it's not my opinion on World of Warcraft that counts, but yours. If you're new to the show, Countdown to Classic goes through your expert opinion on all the issues relating to the sure-to-be-amazing World of Warcraft classic. Today, I'll be playing you a fantastic interview that I conducted recently with theorycrafter Kef Tank as we chat about the vanilla stigma rut, strongly challenging vanilla spec stereotypes, and breaking down a few so-called meme specs. If you're a fan of the show and you consider yourself a bit of an expert in the field regarding certain classes or specs, or any other facet of the game, or simply just casually want to raise a World of Warcraft-related topic that you're interested in, then please do reach out to me and register your interest in sitting down with Countdown to Classic via the show's Discord, Twitter account at Counts2Classic with the number 2, or email me at feedback at countdowntoclassic.com. You'll find all those links in the show notes for each episode. But for now, let's get into this interview with Kef Tank, all about negative Negative spec stereotypes. Okay, we've got another listener on the line now, and who are we speaking to, and where in the world are you calling from? I go by the name Keftank, and I am from the Midwest, United States. Fantastic. Now, Kev Tank, just so everyone knows, you and I have been in a, a little bit of contact recently as I've been uh, gathering a few of your thoughts on a couple of things from the classic Druid Discord, where you're very active. And again, if anyone is interested, please feel free to go over and find Kev Tank and also Taladrill over at the classic Druid Discord. Um, so what we normally do to open the show, as listeners are very familiar with, is we go through your WoW resume. So you ready for a few questions about who you are and your time playing the game? Question number one, with as much specificity as you're comfortable with, where in the world are you from? I am from the Midwest, United States. And how long have you played World of Warcraft? Uh, Let's see, I played through uh, the beta all the way to uh, Wrath of the Lich King, through Wrath of the Lich King, and that is about it. And what was your original main character's name? Uh, Kev Tank. And what was that character's class and race? Uh, it was a torn druid. And what other classes have you hit a level cap with? I have hit a level cap with shaman as well as mage. And we're, sorry, are you talking about just back in the vanilla days? Have you hit level caps with other classes since then, obviously? Uh, actually, just back in vanilla, it was um, exclusively Druid, and then Shaman was Burning Crusade, Wrath, and then Wrath was also Mage. Got you, got you. And which server were you on when you first started? I was on the Manorath server, so uh, it's a vodka groupie. <laughs> and do you prefer to play on PvP or PvE servers? I always PvP. And what was your highest raid experience in the game, be it vanilla or in later expansions? Yep, so vanilla, I did get to Nax. Um, just very, I like basically stepped into Nax. Uh, my guild did clear quite a bit of Nax, but I was not part of it. Uh, TBC um, did not get to Sunwell. I was a bit more casual. And then Wrath, I went you know, through it all. And are you currently playing World of Warcraft? And if so, where? Uh, just pre- uh, Actually, no, I'm not. I am hoping to play back on Light's Hope's fresh server that is coming out here soon. And do you have a quick plug for any places online where people can find you? Are you a streamer? Are you on YouTube? Where can people find you online? Uh, no, you can find me online uh, at the Drew Discord or even the theory crafting vanilla discord. That's pretty much it. 
Okay, last question. Complete this sentence so we know where your allegiances lie. For the... Oh, it's the Lions. Okay, excellent. At least in vanilla, it's Lions. <laughs> it can be a bit fluid at times, can it now? Uh, not in, not in vanilla. It's, it's just the lines. I don't know why people play hard. <laughs> okay. All right. Excellent. You mentioned something recently. Obviously I, I published an episode yesterday featuring Marky Mark or sorry, to real Marky Mark all about warlocks. And one particular question I found was actually one of yours as I venture through the forums. It's always fun to trip across people when I actually use one of their quotes and, uh, it was um, pointed out to you, obviously, in the classic Druid, Disc- Dru- Druid Discord that your quote was used, and um, you stood by uh, the, your comment, and, and you, you mentioned on Reddit that you disagreed with Marky Mark's stance on it. And what I want to do here is I'm just going to read the quote back to people so I refresh everyone's memory. And a- as we do here on the show, we always encourage, encourage a bit of um, you know back and forth. We argue for both sides of the coin. So obviously, we've heard one stance, and, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to back your point up a little bit. So here's the quote, and and you said this on, on the WoW Classic subreddit. I'd seriously question if immolate slash conflag should be used over corruption come AQ and Nax. It really depends on what Blizzard will do with Arcanite Dragonlings debuff, since it adds a flat damage buff to anything fire. Even so, maybe it still isn't better. I'm curious to see. Now, obviously, hearing that quote back to you, I'm sure that that rings a bell. What do you have to say if you were to extrapolate on that point and what the real Marky Mark had to say on perhaps that not being uh, 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 the best idea? Yeah, so um, by no means is this, uh, I guess, fully fleshed out, but we have done some initial testing with uh, a destruction-based warlock, um, due to, and specifically because of the Arcanite Dragonlings uh, f- uh, fire buffet debuff. Um, now, what the user in your last comment uh, mentioned was that you have to go too far down in the destruction tree, that you can't have a demonic sacrifice. Um, and that's not entirely true. Uh, there is obviously a build where you you choose to take... Uh, Conflag, but uh, in our initial testings, Conflag is not actually all that. It's not really that great because you are sacrificing things such as Demonic Sacrifice Imp, which is plus 15% to fire damage. Um, So, I mean, we have experimented with um, that kind of build. We have experimented with Searing Pain, which is uh, kind of the more risky of builds since the searing pain uh, it generates a lot of threat and a lot of threat is bad when you're you know when you are pushing those meters because you risk the chance of pulling hate or sorry threat and the boss coming over and uh, hitting you um, but there's also other builds like, oh, you want to use your imp because your imp's fireballs will then uh, see damage from the fire buffet, and uh, and then you want to sacrifice it, and then you just continue on with your rotation. Um, there's just been a lot of uh, conversation and initial testing around uh, m- making it work, but the the crux of this whole idea is to reduce the debuffs on. If you're optimally speaking about uh, your raid, you want to reduce as much uh, unnecessary debuffs. So we were looking at getting rid of Curse of Shadows, Shadow Weaving, Corruption to uh, better overall increase the raid DPS with uh, fire-specific debuffs, which is what um, changes in Encourage with Scorch and Fire Mages. Okay, now... One particular part that I wasn't aware of that I wanted to run by you, and you, fair, to be fair to you, you obviously say it's, it's highly dependent on this one X factor, and that's the Arcanite Dragonlings debuff. If people are a bit unsure, like me, you, you do briefly mention what it does. Um, what can you tell us a bit more about that debuff and, and how it might affect a warlock's life? 
Yeah, so how it is on uh, the Lights Hopes core, the, the old Nut Stardust core, is um, it is a 20-second debuff. It can stack up to five times. Uh, it's a trinket use. It's a it's basically a pet. Um, and I guess, I, yeah, guilds will pop probably two or maybe three Arcanite Dragon Lanes before the pull, and then they switch back to their trinket. And then, yeah, they just let the the stacks build up. Uh, it can it's affected by spell resistance, so it can resist. So you can't. Sometimes you may not see all five stacks, but the more dragonlings you use, the better chance that is. But what it does is it increases uh, fire damage taken from uh, sources in the raid by a flat amount. Now the one on uh, Light's Hope. Um, Months ago, it used to just do a flat 20. Uh, I have not actually checked what it does now. Uh, there's, I guess, uh, very unconfirmed and not the best factual evidence that vanilla used to do uh, a flat 60. So if you're stacking that five times, it's plus 300 damage to, say, your immolate, to your searing pain, to your fireball. It adds up really quick. Um, even, you know, goblin sappers would most likely see an increase. I have not tested that myself, but um, when you start adding all the modifiers on top of that, so you have your Scorch, you have your Nightfall, I mean, your Curse of the Elements, uh, it really um, becomes very profound. And it's just, it's, it's interesting that the, the community won't even... Uh, really consider it because uh, Warlock has been uh, a certain way for 14 years in vanilla. Okay, so ultimately, if Blizzard were to, you know, we say the uh, the word changes, um, you know, lightly and carefully, but if Blizzard were to either, well, replicate what they did in vanilla or change what they did in vanilla with the Arcanite Dragonling, is there a circumstance where it's clearly going to be the case that uh, Immolate or Conflag could easily be chosen over Corruption? So, uh, one, uh, I guess, comparing Immolate to Corruption, Immolate should always do better or outperform corruption. There is, uh, I guess, an argument to for corruption, rather. Uh, once you get uh, Tier 3, uh, it does receive a 12% damage bonus. Um, also, there's the argument of it procking the talent uh, Nightfall in the Affliction Tree, but most uh, Warlocks are running uh, Demonic Sacrifice Rune spec. Um Immolate, however, benefits from world buffs, whereas Corruption does not. Uh, you cannot crit a, a, de a de uh, damage over time effect, whereas Immolate has an initial hit, and then it has its DOT. Um, that initial hit scales with you know, the Ani buff, uh, Sunflower, um, all the, the int that you're getting from... Uh, Raid buffs and consumables and all that. So uh, it does outperform, but at the same time, um, you are, I mean, corruption is receiving all these uh, modifiers as well from, um, you know, Curse of Shadows, Nightfall. Um, shadow weaving is huge from, you know, your Shadow Priest or what I would prefer, a uh, Holy Priest using. But um, so these are things that. I think, I feel that need to really be looked at and just not dismissed right away. But that would be, I guess, the argument for both. Um, obviously, that Arcanite Dragonling will push Immolate even further. Um, I do not believe the, the Flame Buffet will affect the DOT, but it should affect the initial hit. And if that, the thing is, Immolate can crit, and that is kind of the thing. Um, especially when you have world buffs, that's plus 18% flat spell crit, and then you're adding onto your normal crit. So it can get really high and really reliable. So it's just something to look at. Okay. Now, 
You used the word testing earlier and you, you mentioned some tests that you had done and obviously through all those answers that you just provided, which were I really must say were, were incredibly uh, insightful and perceptive. Thank you so much. It's, it's very, very clear to me that you uh, kind of, you know, have some experience with this stuff. So my next question would be, uh, is the theory, is the field of theory crafting obviously something that you have dabbled with in the past? And, and what's the, the time? Can you explain to listeners, uh, what your time spent with theory crafting has been? And if you've pulled up any kind of general misconceptions that people might have about vanilla? Yeah. Um, so, um, I guess theory crafting actually goes back to, uh, the Nostalgius realm before it was uh shut down um actually right before that point um even actually during that point um i was running in a guild a hardcore guild that actually allowed me to uh experiment with uh, the balance spec for druid and after i mean this was right before shutdown and then right after that you know, I, I moved into quality insurance and on the PTR, I was able to dabble around and uh, just, you know, mess around with what could work. And then from that, obviously the, the realm was uh, released in a, in a, like a pack that anyone can download right now today and play around on their own server. And so we use that, in the theory crafting community to kind of gauge um, all these, I, as you said, misconceptions about um, vanilla. I mean, we aren't, we aren't here. We aren't trying to prove something wrong, but we're trying to be thorough. We're asking the questions of, well, are we really certain that this is not the correct way to do something? Is this not optimal? I mean, like, uh, I guess what I mentioned briefly was the shadow priest with shadow weaving. I mean, shadow priest has a low ceiling cap. Holy weaver can do the same job that a shadow priest brings. So it's like, so we go back and forth and we experiment with uh, just better ways of um, producing results. Now, You and I were chatting uh, very, very briefly earlier, again, over at the Classic Druid Discord, and some of the things you've just mentioned, you you were obviously uh, lightly joking around a little bit, and you said that, um, well, actually, I take that back. You perhaps being tongue-in-cheek, but I'm sure you stand by this point. You mentioned that most vanilla players get stuck in the vanilla stigma rut. And I joked back with you saying that, you know, I'm still getting over my diagnosis of VSR and I'm hoping to get it treated sometime in the near future. But when we talk about the um, sort of well held theories and the the stigma about vanilla the information that people are just holding on to to the death and you've mentioned things like shadow priests versus perhaps a newer concept like holy weaving and things like that what are some of the the bigger things that that irk you and and again you mentioned uh shadow weaving versus holy weaving um in vanilla that people really need to open their minds to i would say that the the biggest thing that uh, bugs me is people aren't willing to even consider the possibility. Um, either they don't fully understand uh, how vanilla works mechanically, or th- you know they they're just coming to play just to play. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But if you're doing that, you can't really be a part of the conversation in a meaningful way. Um, I mean. Vanilla is not figured out. I know it's it's crazy to kind of think about. I mean, 14 years, you would think the game has been, you know, just rung through the ringer and we know everything about it, but we're learning something every single day. Now, granted, we are learning this in, on an emulated server and emulation is not perfect. So there's a lot of uh, going back and pulling up uh, resources and way back machine to kind of confirm these, uh, these initial testings, but, um, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating when you publish something or you start talking about something and it's just immediately, uh, met with, uh, 
you know, disagreement. Uh, I think the, the most recent and most profound uh, example is the feral druid, um, the tanking that Taladrill has published. Um, it's very evident and clear to me that, you know, raids that are optimal, that are pushing the envelope with DPS, need that extra threat that the feral druid can uh, provide for the raid, while, you know, even a dual-wielding fury warrior cannot even uh, touch. Now, if you're not doing that much uh, t- uh, DPS and you aren't having threat issues, your guild doesn't need it, but your guild's also not, you know, running optimally, and that's fine. I mean, you know, people have different ways of playing. You obviously touched on also, um, we, we did start to talk about that, that shadow weaving versus holy weaving argument. And this is something that's really intrigued me, particularly as someone that has a plan to play a priest seriously for the first time when classic drops. And I'm more than happy to heal, but obviously the allure of being a shadow priest is something that will be sort of hard to ignore as well. And you've touched on an argument in, in on both in Reddit and in the classic Druid Discord as well, if it comes up in conversation. Uh, and it's something you see occasionally around the traps where people argue that shadow weaving really is not all it's cracked up to be necessarily because it could be equaled or perhaps even slightly bettered by a holy weaver. Can you tell people a little bit more about what testing you've done or your knowledge of that theory? Yeah, so this actually came from the guild that I used to run with uh, back on Australarius. Uh, they started u- utilizing a Holy Weaver. And, I mean, this guild, it, um, I mean, they are a hardcore raiding guild, um, and they did clear uh, Naxxramas right when it came out. Uh, I believe uh, Dream State actually edged them out. Uh, but they were already experimenting with this idea. And it made complete sense to me. I mean, so Shadow Priest has a low ceiling in comparison to the other spellcasting DPS. Um, it is actually even lower than Balanced Druid Elemental Shaman. Uh, we have done some very initial testings with Smite Priest even, and it's about uh, the same numbers. And I would argue that Smite Priest actually does more due to there being no holy resistance in the game. Um, now, I mean, Shadow Priest obviously only brings, as a raid utility, Shadow Weaving. Shadow Word Pain is incredibly strong. It is actually one of the best DOTs in the game. But, I mean, is that enough to bring that Shadow Priest with that lacking DPS? So the argument is, you use a Holy Priest that isn't specking down in the Discipline Tree for Power Infusion, uh, and that Holy Priest goes, what, 20 points into the Shadow Tree uh, while they go deep into a Holy Tree to kind of make up for that loss of utility of not having a power infusion. Um, there's multiple ways that the Holy Priest can uh, apply the Shadow Weaving debuffs, and that's uh, five points in the Mind Blast. So you're just using Rank 1 Mind Blast. Uh, that's a slower buildup, or you could do Mind Flay and just... Cast it, cancel it, cance- cast it, cancel it five times to get immediate five stacks. Or even Shadow Word Pain, you can spam rank one in fi- uh, five seconds or times the global cooldown. So it's seven and a half seconds to uh, receive five uh, applications of that debuff as well. While you are still being able to heal. And now that Shadow Priest raid spot is free for a DPS that can do much better deep overall DPS than what that Shadow Priest would have been able to contribute to the raid. So you have the healing, you have the 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 debuff, and you have an actual DPS. Now, people want to play what they want to play. I'm not telling them not to play Shadow Priest. If you want to play Shadow Priest, more power to you. But optimally speaking, there is no room for a Shadow Priest. There's... There's no room for a balanced druid, you know. Uh, an elemental shaman is probably the most selfish class or spec in the game. Like, optimally speaking, you don't want any of these things in your raid. Wow. Now, one of the things that really grabs my attention in what you just said um, is that 
the ceiling of shadow priests is, I don't know if you were saying arguably or factually, is lower than elemental shamans and balanced druids. And as we go on this sort of main flow of logic when we talk about common misconceptions and we all laugh at boomkins and we all laugh at ellie shamans, and yet I know people generally regard shadow priests as being not the best DPS in the game and on the lower spectrum, but I think it's a pretty common thought that The people don't believe them to be lower than those two specs that you just mentioned. And you're saying it's actually very much so the case. Is that by way of, um, obviously testing, but I, I, to be fair to you, I should ask, uh, how much testing or what kind of testing went into establishing a point like that? Yeah. So, um, I think the, the misconception that Shadow Priest is kind of relevant in community, Um, accepted is is going back to the vanilla stigma. Um, you know, they were used 14 years ago um, for that very reason. And it wasn't really, you know, 14 years ago, people didn't really know how to play this game. Um, and so it just kind of it has rolled into the private server community. Um, now, as far as testing, we have not, you know, you know, beat Shadow Priest left and right. I mean, we do have uh, a very uh, knowledgeable Shadow Priest in the Theory Crafting Discord that has created um, some stat weighted spell um, spreadsheets. And, you know, he, even he uh, agrees that, you know, even Smite Priest is better than my Shadow Priest. That's why he actually stopped working on the Shadow Priest spreadsheet when he figured out that his Smite. was doing more damage than his Shadow Priest. Um, you know, I have personally tested uh, ceiling caps with Naxxramas tiered gear. Um, you know, it, it's, it's not that impressive. Uh, Balanced Root is definitely beating it. You know, I have kind of exhausted myself with Balanced Root. And then Elemental Shaman is literally pretty crazy, especially with Burst. Obviously... The longer the fights go with all three of these uh, uh, specializations, uh, the worse it becomes. Um, with the exception, I guess, of Shadow Priest, Shadow Word Pain actually becomes better because it becomes more efficient in a very long fight. But Vanilla is not about long fights. Most bosses are dead in a minute. Uh, even for Nax, I mean, you have your rare exceptions like Patchwork, Lotho, um, KT, obviously, but, you know, BWL, everything's dead in like 30 seconds, even through progression, everything's dead in 60 seconds. So um, worrying about long fights is not really um, too much of an issue, but yeah, it, it's kind of funny. You bring up uh, the, the boomkin, uh, the, the stigma of they are umkins um, and elemental shaman is hands down, the worst at mana efficiency. And then it is Shadow Priest, possibly Smite Priest, and then it's Moonkin. I mean, Balanced Druid, they get Innervate, and they're going to use it on themselves. That might be selfish, but, you know, Shadow Priest doesn't get an ability like that, except Inner Focus for a spell. Uh, Shaman, they don't get jack shit. So, I mean, it is how it is. And, This is what is drives me nuts because people don't actually sit down and look at this, that these kinds of, of things and accept reality. I've got literally a million questions that have just spawned out of everything you just said, which is uh, I can't sort of basically slap you on the back enough saying you, you're doing so fantastically well and, and really getting my um, my sort of <laughs> juices flowing, so to speak. But one of the questions I'll start with, and I do want to go in a number of different directions here, but you just mentioned you tailed off with, with Boomkins, obviously. And one quote that I ran by Taladril in my interview with him, and I just quickly wanted to get your take on this, was a, a forum post that I found that said, Uh, in regards to Innovate, the, uh, it was on the official forums, I forget the username, but they said the following, they basically, and I'm paraphrasing, they said, a good druid innovates the priest, a bad druid innovates himself. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so this is this goes back to the vanilla stigma 14 years ago. Um, obviously, uh, I'm assuming the quote is uh, innervating a, a priest that heals. Yes, um, yes. Which is, you know, it, it makes sense. Um, it, you know, priests do kind of outweigh uh, druids in many aspects. Uh, but again, 14 years later, uh, you have your druids and say molten corn black wing lair specking uh, regrowth spec and regrowth spec even though is not very mana efficient it's very possible to maintain um and now that we know that classic is going to have the 1.12.1 talents we know that that spec is going to most likely be the norm in multicore and Blackwing Lair. It still performs in Encourage, but that's when uh, the Moon, moon Glow spec with Healing Touch takes over. So um, Druids are just as strong as of a healer that Priest is. Um, and so that comment, I'm assuming, comes from the pre uh 1.8, or sorry, the pre 1.9, the Encourage patch when before when Druids got their talent overhaul, because that 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 comment then you know has validity. Um, now, innervating a Shadow Priest is actually quite smart. Uh, it increases their DPS by quite a bit. Uh, if you're a Restoration Druid and you are running in a guild that unfortunately runs with a shadow priest, it will do a great deal of uh, raid DPS basically, because they will be able to maintain uh, shadow weaving without having to down rank. And we all should know that down ranking is the best way of conserving your mana. Okay. Now, I just want to run by uh, something by you that I found in regards to Smite Priest, because that's something that you said in your previous answer that, again, I really wanted to follow up on. And the reason I'm asking this is, as I've mentioned, I do plan on maining a priest when Classic comes out. And you said a couple of things that really made my tail start to wag when you basically said that maybe it's not all doom and gloom necessarily, and I'll give you the chance to clarify, for a Smite Priest, if you are respect wholly if you are perhaps i don't know farming on the side outside of raids or doing whatever it is that you do now i just want to run before we get into your your chance to extrapolate on that point and why you feel that smite actually isn't too shabby after all not saying that you've said it's the best dps in the game but just that it's not a write-off um i'll run this quote by you that i've just found on the wow servers subreddit and it's a thread that kicks off titled smite dps holy priests in vanilla and the question is from the original poster fact or fiction and the one post in reply to that that i wanted to run by you is the following and and just listen up it just goes on for a little bit but but catch this one and i'll get you to comment so this is from user mr pipe layer who says this I'm going to have to side with fiction. On the Elysium PTR with Add Item Command, I made a 100% best in slot smite priest. I had something like 30% crit with 600 spell damage. I wasn't raid buffed, but my smites were critting for like 2000 at most. Now, if you actually sit down and think about a raid composition, there's no, sorry, a raid, a raid comparison. There is no Warlock Curse that will benefit you. No Scorch, no Winter's Chill, no Shadow Priest debuff. No talents like Ruin or anything with percentage-based increases except Nightfall. The only thing will be a Paladin Seal of the Crusader debuff, but why would they use that over Wisdom Slash Light? Basically, if you're lucky, your highest theoretical DPS is around 1,000 DPS in the best fucking gear in the entire game. Compare that to an endgame mage or warlock in a raid. And also considering no one in their right mind is going to give KT gear to a smite priest over those other casters. So I would say it's fiction. What would you have to say on that post? So that post is actually um, has a lot of validity to it. It is somewhat correct. Um, 
Smite Priest DPS is not very good. I believe in our initial testings, we did hit close to 1,200. Uh, that was with using Power Infusion on ourselves, uh, and I think completely world buff, so we're even talking about uh, Dark Moon Fair buff. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's very true. There is no uh, curse or really any other holy modifiers to increase the damage of smite um i i i the user mentioned a seal of uh, crusader I, I i believe it's actually judgment of crusader i mean that is a lot like the arcanite dragonlings flame buffet it adds flat damage uh but to his point yeah you're not judging that on um a boss it is very valuable to have a Ret Paladin, if you are running a Ret Paladin, or even just a Holy Paladin in Nax Ramus to judge it so everyone can throw their uh, Holy Waters, but then you replace it right away. So even that Smite Priest isn't going to see that um, flat increase. Uh, they do get Sanctity Aura if you do have that Ret Paladin in the party. But again, that's really the extent of the Holy modifiers. Other than that, you have your just straight damage increase buffs like Nightfall and Traces or, uh, yeah, the uh, Dark Moon Fair buff. Um, but the thing with uh, Smite Priest is, uh, I guess this has not actually, we don't know if uh, Light's Hope is like this. I suppose we could test it. Um, no boss is resistant to Holy because it's not a resistance that exists anymore. So you are only uh, trying to the only resistance that you will see, assuming you are at uh, 16% spell hit, is the level difference. Uh, so level 63 mobs will be, you know, Light's Hope sets it at a fifth, uh, an innate 15 uh, spell resistance, but it's, I think, supposed to be 25. So that's the only way you're going to see resistance. So like a fight like uh, Twin Emperors and AQ40, both of those... Uh, mob. So one mob, if you're unaware, is immune to magic, and one mob is immune to physical, and then they teleport from side to side. Well, theoretically, if it is correct, we should probably test this, though. Uh, a smite priest should be able to just sit in one spot and just smite, 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 regardless of whichever, um, whichever boss is teleporting around, because they should not be resistance to uh, resistant to holy. Uh, that's pretty much the only benefit that I can initially see to Smite Priest. Um, other than that, if a uh, classic does launch with um, progressive itemization, um, this is actually just a very recent discovery in the community. This goes back to people just dismissing stuff. Uh, but the savory de uh, deviate delight uh, fish that is supposed to add, a, a, I think it's a random buff of six different options. One of it is rapid cast. Uh, that would allow smite priest to actually be holy fire priest and just obliterate DPS meters in molten core during progression. So, there are very niche um, ways of utilizing the spec, but yeah, it does not. It, I mean, overall, it. I probably wouldn't be gearing a smite priest with uh, crazy gear unless you're running in some DKP guild where you kind of have to because they have the DKP. But yeah, they don't do that great. Outside of the raid scenario, just one last question to tie off this point on Smite Priests. Outside of raid scenarios, so let's talk about focusing on, on leveling and then maybe farming at 60. If I'm a Holy Priest, I'm a Smite Priest, basically to sum up, why do you say that people still, I don't know, it's hard, I'm not trying to get you to put words in people's mouths, but why do you think it is the case that I spoke to a, a listener recently on the show, in fact, just in, um, 
uh, Wednesday's episode, you heard a call from a uh, listener, Aaron, who basically said that, you know, he had, uh, you know, he was an altaholic. He, he'd leveled every class to 60 back in the vanilla days, pretty much, maybe save one or two. Either way, he has wound up taking each class to 60. And he said he enjoyed also mixing it up, up a bit and took a holy priest all the way to 60. He leveled as holy. And, uh, you know, we see things on the forums of people laughing at that, like, oh, God, you know, do you like pain? What's going on with that? As if you'd level a holy priest. But knowing what, keeping in mind what you've just said about smite priests, is it that basically it's not, even though you said it's not great DPS, is it still perfectly acceptable to, you know, level as one and farm as one and you can still perhaps be better than some other classes? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, level what you want. Um, I was in that boat as well during retail. I took a uh, druid to level 60 as restoration. I don't know what was wrong with me. <laughs> I did it again in TPC. You did it again. A level 60 shaman. So as restoration. So, I mean, I'm, I guess I'm sick, but um, <laughs> in terms of holy priest, I'm assuming you are still getting some talents in the discipline tree, which uh, I'm, I would hope you're taking five points into one specialization. I mean, that is kind of the crux of priest damage outside or like leveling up. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely, yeah, you can use smite. The problem with uh, spamming smite, especially leveling when you don't have the gear, so to speak, is it's not very mana efficient. I mean, you will be drinking a lot, and that could be, I mean, that's perfectly fine. If that's kind of the play style that you want to play, but um, yeah, I mean, it should just do as well as going deep into the discipline tree, um, maybe even better. Uh, I guess I've never really tried. I've never leveled a priest myself. So, and again, sorry, I can't get past this just because I'm so sort of focused on priests at the moment. But perhaps one last one, and I know I'll keep saying that, but. If I were to, you mentioned earlier that um, there's the argument in in a raid scenario that a uh, holy weaver or a smite priest might even potentially equal or do marginally better than a shadow priest. Is that the case for leveling in that we all say, oh, level shadow, just level shadow. Don't even think about it. Shadow is the leveling spec. Is it? Are you pushing people to suggest that perhaps it really doesn't matter? Um, it might not matter. I'm, I can only assume if you're leveling as shadow as well, that you are also getting a wand specialization. The way I, I at least look at the talent tree and understand how priests level is they, they might nuke a little bit, but they throw a power word shield and then they just, you know, play Harry Potter with their wands. Um, that's how I understand how they level. I could be completely wrong. I hope I'm wrong because I'm no expert on leveling priests. But in, uh, going just to clarify in your comment about um, a holy weaver doing just as well as a shadow priest in the raid scenario, uh, they're two different jobs. I mean, holy weaver is not DPSing. They, all they're there is to reapply the shadow weaving debuff, and then they go back to healing. So I if Effectively, every time, if they're utilizing Mind Blast to keep it up, every time Mind Blast comes off of cooldown, they're spending 1.5 seconds to reapply Mind Blast, and then they go back to healing. So, yeah, they're not going to be the greatest healer, I mean, but it's not really a huge loss, but they're keeping up that 15% Shadow debuff, and yeah, they don't have the power infusion to give to the rest of the raid, but that's kind of uh, the trade-off for keeping the shadow weaving while you're able to replace that shadow priest with an actual DBS. Okay. Now, I, I should mention to listeners that this started off as a planned sort of shorter call for calling countdown, but I've been so enthralled by absolutely everything that you've had to say. This is going in a million different directions that I wasn't quite planning on. Is it okay with you if we go on for a little bit longer or have you got to go to sleep? No, we can. we can go on. Um, this is kind of the, uh, 
the issue that I kind of brought up with you. Like I could talk about a lot of this stuff. No, no, I love it. And please, uh, we don't have to jam it all into one interview. I, I've already, so I'm sitting here going like, fuck me dead. I've got to get this guy back another time. So absolutely. We don't have to cover it all now, but thank you so much for, for taking the time for the show. And we'll, we'll just cover off on a few more things. So another point that you mentioned, and, and again, I guess that the, the, the the core of this particular interview and the theme's going to be, I guess, dispelling vanilla misconceptions. Um, you mentioned to me when we were talking earlier that another um, pet peeve, well, not pet peeve, but point of interest for you was that of melee hunters. Um, what? Well, Here's what I'll do when we talk about melee hunters. I, I found another quote that I want to run by you. Um, well, I, I might run a couple by you, but I, I just wanted to get your intro level we'll set it up with this one and this is from the official forums it's a user named Fellstalker. and again apologies if it goes on for just a little bit but i'll run this by you so they say the following it's not that malay hunter was good it's that it held a fantastic feeling that moment as a warrior that you finally pounced upon that that annoying pellet shooting hunter only to be met with sword to sword as he pulls out his dual weapons and starts fighting you within melee range knowing full well he can't escape but damn sure he'd try to finish you off it had a special feeling to it the feeling of being able to fight alongside your pet rather than shooting from far off now wasting any of your arrows or bullets and just sorry not just just wasting your arrows or bullets, but actually meleeing a target down. Uh, I don't think about the damage that classes had back in vanilla. Everybody, oh sorry, I'll rephrase that. Do not think about the damage that classes had back in vanilla. Everybody sucked. Everybody had bad damage. The maximum potential of classes was rarely realized. So melee hunter was just something that felt good. And that's the entire damn point. Shut up about damage for now and focus on the play styles. Now, my question from that post is going to be this. I, I don't necessarily agree with their point that everybody sucks damage-wise, but my question is this. Is the concept of a melee hunter, as this user suggests, really just a fun feeling, or did it actually have merit uh, uh, numbers-wise? So um, speaking from, uh, I guess, a rage perspective, uh, I have personally actually done a lot of work on this. Um, in terms of theory crafting and I completely see it being a valuable uh, resource to utilize in your raid. Um, I actually think, I mean, marksmanship hunter can out DPS it. Um, but the reason why you're using a melee hunter is to keep up nightfall, uh, which is an ax that applies spell vu uh, vulnerability to a mob for five seconds. Um, they just have, uh, the abilities uh, that can maintain that debuff, one of the best. I mean, they're spamming like Wing Clip and Raptor Strike. And Raptor Strike is going to be the crux of that damage that you're going to get from Melee Hunter. Um, it, it, it's pretty surprising how much damage you can actually do. Um, we have only done testing, though, in uh, Next Ramus tiered uh, with world buffs, without world buffs, um, with... Uh, Beast mastery spec versus survival spec. So we've we none of this is really absolutely 100% solidified, but we do have tests of pulling close to a thousand DPS on like a target like patchwork in five minutes. So it's it's staggering. Um, meanwhile, you're keeping up nightfall, which is contributing to more higher raid DPS. Uh, but I mean, marksmanship can hit that hit that number, but you don't see that very often. Um, so it, it, I think there's, a, again, it's a misconception of what Hunter can do and could be doing. Um, and especially by like next Ramus, uh, kind of the meme is hunters are there just to use Trank to on the bosses that enrage. Well, if they're there already as a requirement, why aren't they swinging nightfall? Now every uh, boss does not need nightfall, but you know it leaves that question open. Um, there are issues though with melee hunter, so to speak. With I mean, if you are going to be meleeing with your pet, you need to have excellent pet control, which is a problem in vanilla, and it's a 
probably even further when you have a a boss that is spamming AOEs or there's high AOE damage. But uh, I guess there are ways around that. Um, I mean, we we found out that uh, running what is kind of the staple pet, uh, the wolf, for Furious Howl is actually not that great of a DPS increase. Um, True Shot Aura also is not that great of a DPS increase. I mean, it is better than nothing, uh, but it, it's your warriors and rogues that are going to cry about not having to be able to stroke their e with higher numbers. Um, I mean, we, we look at, we were looking at melee hunter optimally. How can they increase the raid DPS the best? And that's how we kind of look. I mean, that's what we found from uh, experimenting with it. Um, I guess a notable bug, though, we need to mention that Light's Hope has not even decided to fix after two plus years is focus uh, does regenerate at a two times rate. And so that means if you're main lane with your pet, your pet is doing far more DPS than intended. But even still, you know, we have uh, tests and records and documentation of pulling, you know, close to a thousand DPS. So I, th- I don't, I don't know why people knock it because it's very, um, it's legitimate. Like that's just as simple as that. Um, so the whole basis of a melee hunter is that you're swinging nightfall. If a uh, classic does have um, a progressive itemization, Nightfall should have a negative 60 spell resistance debuff instead of the um, the spell vulnerability debuff, which is a huge difference. And that doesn't actually change until, I believe, patch 1.10. So would you really still bring a melee hunter? I mean, because that is their kind of... Uh, I mean, that's what you're looking for. For that may help melee hunter to do is to keep a uh, nightfall up. Uh, otherwise, you would have to equip them with a melee weapon, which is not bad. We have tested uh, uh, scenarios with corrupted Ashbringer, and we have hit over one thousand DPS. So, I mean, it's it's eye opening. I wish more people would um, play around with it. One of the newer ideas is to weave melee hits in, so. You're still doing range DPS with a volley, an aim shot, and your auto shot, and then you run in really quick, and you hit with Raptor Strike, and then you run back out. So uh, it's very, it's a very unknown um, realm for the spec, and I would invite everyone to, you know, figure it out so I don't have to. Okay, now I just want to run by a- another quote uh, with you. Um, and this is something that I've found uh, about uh, Nightfall that you've just been so eloquently discussing and putting forward the argument for. And it's from the official forums, and it's someone quoting another user. And uh, I just want to see if this uh, lights any kind of a fire under you, and, and just listen intently to this one for a second. So the user says this, and, and I'll leave out their name. So noticing a few points. Number one. I only spammed Wing Clip and Raptor Strike if Nightfall wasn't up. Once it was up, I just let auto attacks go through. Number two, more haste and instant attack effects which don't eat a global cooldown like the above seem to be best with spell vulnerability application. And number three, I forgot to add War Chief's Blessing to all of the tests, so I then redid it once again. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like something I posted. It does sound like something you posted because it was you. Yeah, so uh, (laughs) that was the very initial testings that we started with. Um, Yeah, I guess just elaborate really quick on that. Um, We we felt like maybe the best way was to get the, uh, the debuff up and then go back to some better rotation to increase overall rate or yeah, basically to increase overall con- contributed DPS. Uh, we found out that if you just continue to spam 
uh, all your instant uh, abilities. Basically, it was overall, it's going to be better, depending on how much spell damage you actually have in the raid. Um, meanwhile, we were still able to uh, maintain quite a high uh, amount of personal DPS with our pet. So, um, yeah, that, that was just a process. Uh, haste definitely adds a lot. Uh, I can tell you that Horde Hunters outperform Alliance Hunters greatly in terms of uh, upkeeping of Nightfall. Um, I mean, we haven't fully tested it yet, but it's looking a lot like that Paladin, Retribution Paladin, sadly, maybe even Holy Paladin, to be completely honest. That's something to test. Maybe the uh, the optimal choice to keep Nightfall up for Alliance. Um, obviously, I do not want to omit Warrior. Warrior is going to be most likely the top due to Fury, or Flurry, sorry, but Fury spec is what would really swing it. Um, optimally speaking, I want to get that very clear. We are speaking about optimal setup, so you don't have an off tank that's a protection warrior. But um, the problem is Fury Warrior has a huge DPS ceiling, whereas a Hunter doesn't or a Retribution Paladin doesn't. So that's why you would give it to the job to a hunter or red palette instead of a warrior, but warriors upkeep is very high. So I just don't want to think people don't want to put it on a warrior at all. Now, just when you hear something, just very quickly, when in going through these forums and when, you know, when I Google Malay hunters and search through the forums for Malay hunter threads and the majority of the posts are simply lol, Malay hunters, lol, Malay hunters, good one, funny one. How does that make you feel? Uh, you know, it's the same. It's the same shit with pretty much everything I tend to work on. Um, it's it's that vanilla stigma, and now I'm sounding like a broken record, kind of using it over and over again. But uh, these are just people that don't. They do not understand the game that they are playing. Uh, they're just playing it to have fun. And, you know, I, I'm, what I'm doing, I get enjoyment from it, but I'm trying to understand why, you know, the group, the community thinks that way. And maybe they're, they're, they are wrong and they need to start thinking in a different way. Um, so I just roll my, you know, I roll my eyes at those comments, uh, you know, as you mentioned at the beginning of this, the Druid Discord is very active and, you know, the Druids go through so much of this every day, you know, um, it's like, it's restoration is our only accepted spec or something, whereas really any of our specs can perform, uh, you know, Feral, Bear, Druid Tank is pr probably going to be performing our best, but, um, you know, I would, I would, I would just hope that people could, uh, become a little bit more educated before they start just commenting troll and bait like uh, comments like that. It's just crazy. Now, just one last quote of yours again from the classic Druid discord that I'll run back to you and just to get a, a bit of a fun commentary on, on what was going on. You said once that you used an entire vacation period just staring at nightfall swings for 50 plus hours in a week. Is that legit? How much time did you really spend now? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> I don't have much of a life. That's probably why I play <laughs> WoW, um, which is sad to say. But, um, yeah, I had a week off, and, you know, the, the, the stipulation is that, yeah, no, you do not bring a hunter, and you, they definitely do not melee. Um, you know, we even have druids in the druid discord that uh, still make memes about it. But, um, so... We, or at least I felt the testing was required and it needed to be as good as it could be. So I sat there doing hour long tests of just swinging and swinging and swinging nightfall. Uh, you know, I set my mana to infinite, so I didn't have a problem there. But um, yeah, I would do like 12, 14, 15 uh, tests in a day and then call it a day and then pick it back up. So. 
Um, some days longer, some days not as long. Uh, that's why I don't want to continue doing Nightfall, and I would love if someone picked it back up uh, because it's boring as shit, and I don't want to continue doing hour-long tests. Now, you, you've touched on it just very briefly a few times through this interview, um, the, the point of Boomkins. And is it fair to say that now, as of right now, they've become somewhat of a focus for you? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, I'm not sure if you you have even come across the spreadsheet that I published, but um, I did publish kind of a a spreadsheet that the Warriors have, even Feral Cats have. Uh, Taladrill has posted, uh, you know, a collective Druid spreadsheet, but um, uh, I kind of emulated it a lot off of Guy Brush's Warlock spreadsheet. So it's it's kind of built in that manner. But yeah, it puts uh, it assumes the best, or it, if you want it to assume the best for that Moonkin. So it's pretty extensive. Now uh, we we spoke earlier, and, and you were open to um, the idea of coming back on the show uh, in the future to do a deep dive into balanced druids. And uh, so I don't want to sort of spoil too much the kind of content that we might get into when we have that chat. But just very generally, what is your commentary on the stigma, and as we keep coming back to the vanilla stigma about balanced druids? Well, the number one vanilla stigma about balanced druids is that they're uh, umkins. They run out of mana super quick, which is not the. It's just not how it is anymore. Um, you know, I can run with like a little over eight thousand mana, um, and if you do need a down rank, which it really is just like Lothab or maybe Lothab or Patchwork, then you down rank your spells, but. Um, uh, like I don't know, I I don't know how much you want uh, me to talk about it uh, since you want to do this in a different episode. But um, you know they're better than what people make them out to be. They're not great. Uh, they're better than a shadow priest. They're better than a smite priest. But they're not. You know they're not amazing. And again, I'm presuming that's something that's. Uh not just a knee jerk reaction, but, but proven by the numbers that you, then the testing that you've done. Yep. Yep. Um, there's actually a really very eye opening and staggering test that can happen in next Ramus. Will it ever happen? It should at least once statistically, you know, some, some lucky moonkin out there should at least get it once, but, uh, it, it yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, to me, it was very uh, thought-provoking that, holy shit, Moonkin can actually accomplish something like this. Okay. Well, you've made it through the interview, so I thank you so much for that. Now it's time for the fun stuff. And with all that done now, it's time for Anger Management. Each interview, I ask the interviewee to get some anger off their chest and spout on about something that really pisses them off about vanilla World of Warcraft. So, Kef Tank, is there something that really gets your goat about the game? Uh, the community. Ooh, excellent. Go on. Uh, you know, uh, 14 years ago, this might have flat, and you know, it might have been acceptable, but... You know, we're all 14 years, uh, I guess, more experienced, older, uh, and everyone is still clinging to the old ways, you know, uh, of how the game was played. And it's a very different game. It's a very different community. And there are a lot of new ideas that should be uh, expanded on instead of just buried away because that's how it used to be. Excellent. All right. Shots fired, community. Come on. When we're playing classic, expand your minds, people. Okay. And uh, with that done, now it's time for the hot seat. (laughs) 
each interview, I put the interviewee on the hot seat and asked them a few fun hypothetical questions about the game. Okay, here we go. Question number one. Between melee hunters, balanced druids, and smite priests, who gets off the island of misfit toys first? Who's the best of those three and, and makes the cut? Melee hunters. Oh, excellent. Okay, I like that. All right, how about this one? Now, you spent a fair bit of time as a druid. Would that be fair to say? Yes. All right. Well, a boomkin, a cat, and a bear walk into a bar. Who gets the girl and why? Uh, I'm going to say the moonkin. <laughs> and what, what is it about the, the, the moonkin that would get the girl? Uh, he has the moves of Chris Farley. He, sh- he sure does. And what girl does Absolutely. And everyone comes back to that dance, that fun little dance. I guess the, the, the ladies like it, the dancing. All right. Now, next question. I'm going to say fuck, marry, kill. Again, we'll go with the three druid specs, just a bit generally. So we go resto, balance, feral. What's your personal preference? Fuck, marry, or kill? Uh, I would probably say... Fuck uh, Feral, kill Balance, and marry uh, Resto. Okay. Now, what's the meanest thing that you've ever done in the game? Meanest thing I've probably ever done in the game was actually back in Classic, or not, sorry, back in Vanilla, um, jumping off of Thunder Bluff with just a bunch of uh, randoms. But I popped a, a, what was it called? A flask of petrification, and it keeps you in the air. So everyone else just fell to their death. Obviously, I died too, <laughs> but it was just kind of kind of funny. Okay. And do you have a proudest in-game moment? In vanilla? Uh, yeah. Hitting level 60 for the first time. Great answer. Fantastic. I'm sure a lot of people felt the same way. Inversely, do you have a most embarrassing in-game moment? Yeah, I leveled Restoration Druid to level 60 <laughs> for the first time. Very good. Excellent. Were you not exactly shouting from the hilltops about that one? Oh, I was shouting. Uh, <laughs> I, I can remember uh, the uh, EPL grind. I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I Restoration? And I just kept doing it. I don't, I don't even know why. <laughs> All right. Now, do you remember the moment outside of the first five minutes of the game when you fell in love with World of Warcraft? Not really, no. I was uh, conversely playing Final Fantasy XI at the same time. So it was just kind of a natural progression. I guess I actually started... I, I, uh, I guess became enamored with uh, World of Warcraft... Kind of when uh, the Burning Crusade came out and kind of erased all my work. And that is not how I was kind of accustomed to with Final Fantasy XI. Because Final Fantasy XI built off of your, what you accomplished. And so I immediately, even with, even though I think TBC was great, I became more entranced with how the game used to be. Oh, that's an interesting point. I never really thought of it that way. I, I like that. Okay, final question. Tell me why you, Kev Tank, are most excited for World of Warcraft Classic. I get a return to, I guess, quote unquote, those glory days. Um, I'm not necessarily looking to play it for a nostalgic reason, but pretty much because of all the work that we have done through the private server community, uh, it's just kind of seen the fruits of our labors. Uh, you know, paying off. You know, we were able to successfully get Blizzard to launch this. So that's what I'm most excited about. Fantastic. All right. Well, you made it through the interview, Kev Tank. And again, I just want to say thank you so much. I really do appreciate you taking the time out for the show. I've had a lot of fun during this interview. Your answers have really got, uh, as I said, uh, got me on the edge of my seat and I, and I enjoyed that thoroughly. Thanks so much again for coming on the show. My pleasure. 
And that's the interview done. And thank you so much to Kev Tank again for taking the time out for Countdown to Classic. If you ever want to hear more from Kev Tank, then you can find him at the phenomenal Classic Druid Discord, which now has had three prominent members featured on the show. And that's because it's a great Discord, which I couldn't recommend more, as they do tend to chat about a little bit more than just Druids as well. You'll find a link to that Discord in the show notes, So please click on that and go and say hi to the group and to Kef Tank as well, who can regularly be found passionately disproving myths via number crunching. And with that, you can help take your knowledge of Vanilla World of Warcraft even further. Anyway, that's the show, everyone. But just before you go, I want to shout out to the members of the Countdown Council, whom I call every week for input on where the show should head in the week to come. So shout out to Borzen, Ray. Raidmar, Cam Sowen, Palfurus, Permadrunk, Rarebit, Seven Winters, Tsunami, The Anton, Wilson Ma, and Velarco. Thank you so much for your amazing support of the show. Countdown to Classic would not be the same without your support. And also a big thank you to supporters Hurlbert, Good Kisser, Myrtle Banks, and Purgatos81, as always. Anyways, thanks for listening, everyone. I shall see you again on Friday. Look forward to seeing you all then. Have a great day. 